Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part four of CTSS Most Popular Cases. Here are 10 cases that all of you loved, and I thought I would speak about them briefly and just make some key points. So in case number one, you see a vascular lesion in the tail of the pancreas. Pancreatic lesions that are vascular, you think about neuroendocrine tumors, also, you could think about metastatic renal cell carcinoma if the patient had a prior nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy, particularly for clear cell RCC. And just a very nice example showing you the typical neuroendocrine tumor giving liver metastasis, which are also very vascular, widespread from measuring several millimeters to measuring over five centimeters. Just a really nice example. CT is really good for detecting neuroendocrine tumors as well as for staging. Things like radiomics now are able to try and grade neuroendocrine tumors as well as predicting survival and response to therapy. So lots more coming in this space. But again, just a really nice look at the typical neuroendocrine tumor, the primary mass, as well as the liver metastasis. Now in case two, this is a patient with an unusual syndrome, McCune Albright. I just wanted to show you the unusual bone lesions, almost like square cystic lesions in the lumbar spine, in the body, as well as the spinous processes. Patient also had a cystic pancreatic mass, a very unusual case. Now, case number three is cardiac case. There's a lot of images. We look for coronary artery disease, but the first thing you look at is coronary anatomy. And if you look at this case, the patient's left anterior descending coronary artery, in fact, the patient's left main coronary artery, and then the LAD arise from the right cusp. And you could see on the images, they track anteriorly and then go from right to left. A variation and an important anomaly. You can see it very nicely on the 3D mapping. And on the 2D mapping, the path of the patient's left main coronary artery as it tracks from right to left, arising with the patient's um, right coronary artery. Here you can see it very nicely on the 3D reconstructions, the two vessels coming together and then splitting off. Important findings when you do a coronary CTA. Now, in case number four, Non-contrast, you see some unusual lesions in the liver. You then see infiltration of the perirenal space right kidney, as well as a lesion in the right kidney. You then notice that there are multiple small lesions in the liver and the spleen, and then the involvement of the kidney. What can you think about? You could think about sarcoid, particularly for the liver and the spleen, but not really for the kidney. The kidney makes me think about lymphoma, but also we see all the time that lymphoma and melanoma can look similar, multi-organ distribution, peri and pararenal space involvement, and liver and splenic involvement. So a really nice example of multiple liver and splenic lesions, as well as involvement of the peri and pararenal space. The patient also has involvement of the spine, including the right and left side of the patient's sacrum, as well as iliac bone. Melanoma involves many areas. You want to look carefully at the subcutaneous tissues. You want to look into muscle. Uh, again, the organ involvement from liver to spleen to kidneys. Also look carefully at the stomach, the small bowel, as well as the colon. Now in case five, we see a patient with fluid in the abdomen, but the fluid's high density. And you recognize as you scan downward that you're dealing with hemoperitoneum. Now, CT is very good for detecting the presence of blood and determining its cause, whether it's bleeding in the stomach or bleeding in small bowel or bleeding in the colon, or in this case, bleeding in the retroperitoneum. CT is very good at detecting the bleed. It's good at determining its cause. Is it a trauma patient? Is it a patient with diverticulitis, a patient with angiodysplasia, a patient with an underlying tumor like a GIST tumor? But you can see very nicely here on the arterial phase imaging, the active bleed, particularly uh, midline and left of midline. And as we track downward, the active bleeding is seen. But as you go from arterial to venous phase imaging, the 
blood in the peritoneal cavity is seen, but the act of bleeding is less prominent. When we do cases for GI bleeding, regardless of the suspected cause, we always do dual phase imaging. Lesions are typically well seen in both phases, but often you'll see an increase in the brightness of the blood as we go from arterial to venous phase imaging, and very nicely shown in this case. This case shows very nicely atrophy of the brain. You can see the uh, lobulations in the uh, cortex of the brain. You can see the fissures are widened. This was likely a sequela of the patient having uh, previous trauma. Just a very nice example of atrophy, increased fluid. There's no fracture. Or there's no deformity of the skull but just significant atrophy of the brain. Uh, obviously, this isn't a child. Uh, atrophy can be due to many causes, including anoxia at birth. It can be due to trauma. It can be due to a range of conditions. And here's just 3D mapping of the patient's skull. This is an interesting case. Dilated bronchial arteries can be confused with nodes, particularly in non-contrast scans. You can see the dilated bronchial arteries here. We can see this in a range of findings. We can see it with tumor. We can see it in patients with pulmonary artery stenosis. We can see it in patients with prominent collaterals due to compression of other vessels in the mediastinum. We can see this as part of congenital heart disease. You can see very nicely the branches of the dilated bronchial arteries, which here come off the um, aorta. You can see them in the posterior mediastinum, in the middle mediastinum, and in the anterior mediastinum. Again, it's one of those things that can be somewhat confusing at times. Just some really nice examples of those dilated bronchial arteries. Now, in case number eight, there's a large cystic mass head of the pancreas. It's well-defined. I don't see calcification. I don't see septations. I got to think first of a serous cystadenoma. I could not exclude a pseudocyst from pancreatitis without a history. Mucinous cystic neoplasm is considered, but they often have septations, are more commonly in the body and tail of pancreas rather than head. Serous cystadenomas patients are 65. MCNs typically 45. Again, very well defined. Um, Cirrhosis adenomas have a range of appearance. They can have septations. They can have a Swiss cheese appearance. They can be oligocystic, like this case, with displacement of adjacent things like vessels. They're always benign. There's no malignant potential. They're not going to bleed. They can be symptomatic simply because of mass effect. And so as they get larger, they're often resected. Just a really nice example of a classic serous cystadenoma, shown nicely here, displacing vessels on the arterial mapping. Here's a patient with multiple IPMNs. The one by the tail has calcifications, but there are multiple IPMNs present. This is a challenge in terms of management. Remember, we worry about IPMNs having malignancy. Do you do a distal pancreatectomy? Do you do a total pancreatectomy? Well, total pancreatectomy would cure the patient, but patients with total pancreatectomies develop diabetes. Uh, they often have significant problems post-op, and their lifespan is shortened by the total pancreatectomy. It is a challenge to follow multiple pancreatic lesions. We tend to look at the largest one as the one of most concern. But again, you need to look at all the lesions and look at them carefully. Using CT and using MR, careful short-term follow-up is usually ideal. And this is just a very nice example of multiple IPMNs. Finally, case number 10 in this patient with chest pain, there's high density in the ascending and descending aorta and in the arch. This you have to consider to be an intramural hematoma. Often intramural hematomas are best seen in the non-contrast scans, though in this case you can see it nicely in the arterial imaging as well. 
Intramural hematomas, you'll look for an ulceration. There's often an ulceration shown on the 3D reconstructions. Intramural hematomas can be treated conservatively and will resolve over time. Here's a nice example of the small ulceration in the descending thoracic aorta outpouching on the sagittal view, very nicely shown with the intramural hematoma across the range from arterial to non-cons to delayed phase imaging. So that's 10 cases. I hope you enjoyed them, and I hope I gave you a few pearls that you may find helpful. And with that, I'll see you next time. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.